Okay, so thank you very much for having me. Um, glad to be here. For those, hands up, who was here last year? Okay, so there's a few arms in the room. Okay, good. Well, I hope none of this is too repetitious for you, however. Um, last year I came along and I talked a lot about the new version of the Univada site that we had developed and that we're mid-launch at the moment. This year I'm hoping to take a little bit more time to focus on another topic area. Um, one of the things I often get asked if I'm talking about Univadis, I'm present, presenting Univadis to a crowd, is why? Why on earth would a commercial organization, which is a, not a charity, um, do something that is non-promotional and free of charge? So I hope that today I get to spend a lot more time giving you a bit more background and information about why we as an organization see this as a valuable initiative. Um, before I do that though, for those who weren't here last year and for who perhaps um, have never heard of Univadis before, the high level details. High level details, does that even exist? No. Um, oh, crikey, sorry. Uh, Univadis is an online website. It's um, providing free and non-promotional information to healthcare professionals around the world. Currently, we are live in approximately 40 countries, um, and we have a, a membership base of around 2.1 million users, uh, closing in on 2.2, but ah, we just didn't make it for this morning, unfortunately. Um, the content that we provide comes from independent third parties that we work with, with partners um, both at a global level and at a local level, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. You may have, if there's anybody here from the US as well, I'm not sure, but maybe, um, you may have heard of the Merck Medicus service, which essentially is exactly the same thing, same tech, same content, same team behind it, it's just a slightly different name. So, what am I going to talk about today? The value of a non-commercial engagement, as I say. What is the point in providing a service that is free and non-promotional? Um, we see it really in the area of relationships, and I'll dive into that a bit more detail. I'll also talk about um, this topic of ROI, um, because determining return on investment for a non-promotional service um, has a few of its own added nuances. Um, and then. Hopefully we'll wrap up with what kind of benefit we think that that has for, for us. This here, this is our three main pillars of why we think that providing a service like Univadis is of benefit to Merck MSD. Okay? Um, I'm not looking at what value we think we're providing to the healthcare professional necessarily at this point. It's really about what does MSD see as the benefit. Three pillars that form the cornerstone of a customer engagement strategy. First off, reach. When a user registers for the service and they do need to register, they can opt in to receive communications from Univadis. They can also opt in to receive corporate or promotional communications uh, that are centered around product information. So we're giving control over that interaction method like Tim presented there for M3 where the user is presented with the option to be able to engage with a rep. You're putting the control for the engagement, how you communicate and when you communicate and on what topics into the hand of the user, into the hand of the healthcare professional. You're letting them, you're empowering them to be involved in how you communicate to them. On top of that, by developing that individual relationship with someone who's logging in, we are creating that customer insight. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the last day or so about big data and how data is everything and how data is going to save us. And while I think the data is very important, I'm a firm believer that, first of all, it's really up to who's interpreting that data as to how valuable the data is and what you're going to do with it. It's not really about the data itself, it's about the insights that you can glean from that data in the long term. And what we see with Univadis is an opportunity to really identify we can but don't, as Ragnar mentioned yesterday, down to an individual level, but we can start to identify trends in user behavior and online behavior um, and use that uh, internally. From a trust and value point of view, um, this is what we see as our key differentiator in the market. Right? You're giving a face-to-face -face rep 
or face-to-face -face engagement, you're extending that outside of a promotional context. And you're providing um, support services, support information that a healthcare professional needs outside of the promotional context. It's recognizing them as a more holistic human being, if you will and providing them with services that they find valuable and that they can trust. There isn't any bias in it. We publish good stories about competitors, we'll publish bad stories about Merck. We're not trying to scrub or change the information that's out there already anyway. Right? So that's a way that we can engender trust in the relationships that we're building with our healthcare professionals and that marks Merck out as a um, as a partner, as a differentiated partner in what is, frankly, a very challenging space. The other thing, and this is something that I wouldn't say it's new, but it's certainly something that is expanding for us, it's, um, is this idea of top customers and partners. Um, partners being uh, of many different types, and I'll touch on it a bit more, but this is a growing area for us where we can engage with institutions, we can engage with governmental organizations, and we can help to facilitate the engagement between them and HCPs. Um, works for us, it helps us to be part of the conversation, um, and that can only be a good thing. So really for us, we see the Univada service as actually um, a competitive advantage when you're talking about customer engagement. Now I'm going to dive into each of the pillars in a little bit more detail. When we talk about reach, this I'm hoping is a, a nice visual to help explain it um, uh, as easily as possible. This is what we would call our permission marketing mechanism, right? So again, when the physician comes in to the site, registers for the site, they can opt in to receive the product communications. And when they receive those product communications, they push over into the more commercial side of the organization where we can enable product sales, okay? Um, it's permission marketing. They are constantly and always in control of that mechanism. They can change their, uh, their opt-in settings, change their subscri subscription settings at any point in time. So it's again, they've permitted us to market to them and they maintain the control over how and when that happens. Again, if we're developing attractive, scientific, valuable information and services that we're providing on a daily basis that help the individual, and I do mean the individual, um, we're talking about personalizing the experience. It's not just about throwing a bunch of information out there onto a website. We hear content is king. We hear that there is so much content out there. What we're trying to do is to facilitate the access to that information. And by facilitate, I don't mean direct. What we mean is to make it easier to find the information that is relevant, be easier to find the information that's trustworthy, um, and to be supportive on a daily basis to improve patient outcomes, help people to do their jobs. Doing that, again, it's a differentiator. And when we talk about partnerships, we have partnerships at a number of levels. The first level, and this was where we started um, oof, 2008, possibly even before that, was really partnering with some of the top class content publishers out there. Um, started with the BMJ in 2008 with the Lancet the German Network. These guys are providing us with those, uh, those pieces of content that are trustworthy, that are valuable. What's grown for us from these early beginnings is we're now starting to also be able to engage and partner with individual HCPs who, believe it or not, have their own content. I suppose this shouldn't be a shock to anyone. We're working with Professor Herschel, um, who's based in Switzerland. Um, I don't know if anybody knows who he is. Um, he's got a, a bit of a reputation in the AIDS HIV AIDS therapy area. He's developed over the years that he's been practicing a massive database of images that he thinks are very valuable and he wants to share with healthcare professionals around the world. So we're working with him to help facilitate access to that image database and he's the first of many. The benefit for us is kind of obvious, right? We get to provide content and services to our healthcare professionals. Um, 
and we get uh, a bit of benefit from the fact that we're working with really highly respected, world-renowned organizations. But it doesn't just benefit us and it doesn't just benefit the healthcare professional, it benefits the content provider as well. When we started working with the BMJ in 2008, their brand was known, but I wouldn't say widely known or even widely accepted, um, in Europe and the US. We've helped them to grow their brand into new markets. As we've opened up new geographies with Univadis and, and, um, and brought online a bunch of healthcare professionals in new places like Latin America, Russia, India, China, we've been able to help our content providers to grow their brands in these, in these markets as well. As we're doing partnerships with content providers, we're also now partnering, um, and more strongly these days, with scientific societies and institutions. So there's a couple of examples here. Um, the RAMS is the Russian Academy of Medical Sciences. Um, they represent a large number of healthcare professionals and organizations in Russia, and they work with us to accredit, to validate the educational content that we provide on Univadis, and they've created a local advisory board um, who help to tell us what content we should be focused on for our HCPs in that market. They've also facilitated introductions to universities who can help us to, again, start to develop additional content pieces that are of value in that market. The uh, I can't pronounce it, I'm sorry. Associado Medica No, I'm not even going to do it. AMB. The AMB guys, similar sort of situation. They've accredited all of our educational courses. Um, they're involved with us in doing co-promotion activities around the launch of Univadis in Brazil, which happened about two months ago, thereabouts. It's a really great way of engaging with the scientific community in, uh, in these local organizations. We can do it at a global level. This is an opportunity for our local teams to also engage with and get benefit from this. We're also partnering with payers. So this is another one that I can't pronounce and I'm not even going to attempt it. This organization in China uh, worked with us to review our educational modules from the BMJ, um, largely, uh, around cardiology and developed a curriculum of cardiology courses that each of the healthcare professionals in their region must complete to maintain their license. Okay, so we're helping them to ensure a high quality education for their healthcare professionals in a particular disease area and they're helping us to grow our user base. So, in a summary with that, we are, with Univadis, starting to redefine what it is to be a customer. Or not just what it is to be a customer, but who the customer is at the end of the day. We've heard it the last few days, and I'm sure if any of you have been to conferences in the last weeks, months, years, you hear a lot more about, well, the, HK, the healthcare professional at an individual level is not necessarily the customer. It used to be, oh, it was just the physician. It's grown to, okay, healthcare professionals. Now it's grown outside of healthcare professionals and into those scientific societies, the, the top customers, the payers. So we're able to use the Univadis model to very proactively engage with these various customer types um, and to begin to build the relationships uh, with them. In addition, we're redefining our position, okay? Merck is not just a drug company. Merck is a healthcare company. Merck's providing services, and Univadis is only one of a multitude of other offerings that we're providing that are expanding our business outside of pure product. Okay, product is obviously core and vital to everything that we do, uh, but we are providing other services and solutions that help us redefine our position as a healthcare organization. On top of that, we're redefining our position with our providers, right? Everybody knows farmers being squeezed, your budgets are decreasing. And we're able to redefine the way that we engage with these people to say, okay, well, it's not just about farmers here to provide the money. Farmers here to provide facilitated access to services. Farmers here to provide value, and we're going to provide that value not just to a healthcare professional, but to all of the providers we work with. 
um, and that helps us to change our model and get a lot of uh, efficiencies, I would say. Okay, so that's hopefully a bit more about the why. Why does Merck do it? And I hope that made sense to everybody. How do we measure it? Now, Tim said, well, you can measure it with sales. Surely it is about the sales at the end of the day. Eh, not so much with Univalis. From a regulatory point of view, you can't provide a non-promotional, non-commercial service and relate it to increased pharma sales. Doesn't work. And on top of that, that's not why we're here. I've just spent a little bit of time boring you with the idea that we're here to create relationships, to engage with people. So for us, it's not about trying to measure a monetary value. But that's a little bit disingenuous, right? Because providing a service like Univadis, it's not cheap. Um, I wouldn't say it's as expensive as some as you might think it is, but it's not cheap. But what we have found is that it is 50% less expensive to manage a service like Univadis and to be able to engage with our healthcare professionals. Okay? Um, when we're looking at using our Univadis database of permission marketed opted in users versus renting those third party databases from somewhere else. Also, we spend a lot of time on data hygiene, um, and I'm sure most services spend a lot of time on data hygiene, but not everybody does. And in our experience, if you compare renting a list versus using one of the Univadis lists, the data quality in terms of bounces, invalid email addresses, etc., is approximately 100% better <laughs> than going external. So how do you measure a relationship? It's not easy. Um, these are some of the key KPIs that we use um, to determine how we're doing in terms of forming, developing, and retaining our, uh, our engaged users and our relationships. So looking specifically at sort of site stats, registrations, it's an obvious one, as is the average monthly usage, as is recency, so um, what was the period of time since a particular user logged in last, and frequency, how often are they coming back. Engagement is, thing, is something that's um, also quite difficult to define. So you can talk about how deeply are they engaging with your service, how deeply are they visiting the site, how many pages are they looking at, how many visits do they come back for on a day-to-day -day basis um, or on a monthly basis. Have they opted in for the commercial, um, for the commercial uh, communications or not? Light, deep and extensive engagements, we would sort of level out at, okay, light, Someone's opened an email. They've seen some sort of communication from you. A deep engagement means they've actually come to the site. They've taken some time. They've come to your site and they've navigated around the site. And an extensive engagement could be something like they've taken a course, they've spent half an hour or so getting themselves a certificate in a particular topic. Okay? But it's not just about the hard stats. You've got to have some of the softer elements to this as well. So we do use the Net Promoter Score. So thank you, Yannick, for that. Um, the Net Promoter Score to manage or to track the satisfaction of our users over an extended period of time. Content relevance. What do they think of the content relevance? Do they intend to use a particular site? What do they think about MSD as a result of using the service? And core for us is, have, do they feel that we've helped them to better treat their patients? Have we helped them to do their job? Um, and that's something that, although it's the last point on the slide, it's last but not least, really. So, is there a benefit? I hope that what I've just explained in the last 15 minutes, I guess I'm at now or something, um, has sort of demonstrated that yes, from a Merck point of view, Merck MSD point of view, we absolutely do believe that there is a benefit um, to providing a service like Univadis. Um, but there's a topic I just want to touch on. Um, it's a sort of a sidebar tangent, if you will, but I had to do it. Some people will look at something like Univadis and say that, okay, this is an example of corporate responsibility. And 
assumed, you may be right. I think the thing that I find interesting about this is that customers these days, and there's a very interesting, I'll put the link down the bottom, so if you do get a chance, go and have a look at that when you get the presentations later. The, an interesting report done by McKinsey on, and in very high-level summary, the fact that <coughs> customers these days, whether you're talking consumer, non-consumer, they expect corporations to be doing something of value, whether that be corporate responsibility or it be provision of a value-add service or whatever. You have to start with a really good product in the first place, otherwise doing corporate responsibility, doing value-add is not going to help you. In fact, according to McKinsey, it may damage you. But if you have good products, if you have a core service offering or product offering that is of value to begin with, doing a corporate responsibility type <laughs> initiative can be a good thing. The other important thing to mention is that the customers don't expect companies to be doing these corporate responsibility initiatives for no benefit. What they do expect is that you're transparent and you're open about what you're doing, how you're doing it, and why you're doing it. And I think that's something that, um, that goes quite deeply into the core of what the Univadis philosophy is and how and why we're developing and providing this service. So, in summary, I'm sure some people going, I can go get my coffee. Um, in summary, Univadis is about demonstrating a partnership into the healthcare industry, not just pharma, again, it's healthcare. We've been doing this for 120 years, right? The Merck manuals have been around since the company's been around. Um, and this really is just an extension of what, we, what we've been doing since time immemorial. We want to provide relevant and value-added services that meet our customers' expectations. We want to build relationships with valuable partners and be a valuable partner to our providers, to our healthcare professionals, to everybody, um, and provide value to the business in terms of the trust and value and extending our digital reach. That, for Merck, is the value of a non-commercial engagement. Thank you. So I'm sure we'll have questions because there's been lots of discussion on Twitter, and I, but I'll kick off with a question from Len Starnes, who I presume is probably in Berlin. Ah. So Len is one of the freeloaders who didn't bother to pay to be here, but he's been <laughs> following the Twitter following feed. Avidly. <laughs> so Len wants to know, why has Univadis succeeded when other pharma company run HCP networks haven't? What do you think is the key reason? I think we've been... First of all, I think the philosophy that is engendered in Merck, as I mentioned, the Merck manuals, it's a philosophy of provision of service that's been with us. Mm. It's part of the corporate culture. I think also we've been quite lucky that we are led by, um, led by leaders who have seen Univardis and Merck Medicus, I, I always combine the two, but they've seen us um, in a long range, they've had that vision for the long range engagement mm. strategy. They saw what it could be back in the early days and they started to build that reach and that database um, and really now are able to start to communicate about the value and the benefit of that to the business. So I think um, those two key elements for me are the reasons mm. that we've succeeded where perhaps others. Mm. I think also the, the the broad acceptance without, throughout the organization from a geogra geographic perspective means that we've been able to expand quite quickly. And now we can't go away, can we? So does it take 10 years to get the benefits? Oh, no. No, 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 no. I think it takes 10 years to realize what the benefits are and make sure you can communicate them arti in an articulate fashion. But the benefits have always been there. Thank you, Shona. Good job. Thank you. That was good. Uh, the, the question I had was around customer acquisition. Yes. Do you know how much of that comes through the sales reps? Ah. Okay. So customer acquisition, does it come from sales reps? Well, we as Univadis, we run, we're a product, right? And we're going to market ourselves like a product, which means we market ourselves in a multi-channel way. Okay. Um, which means we use Salesforce, we use email channels, we use print, we use all sorts. Um, and I think it's very market dependent 
as to whether or not the sales force is engaged at all, because there's regulatory concerns in some markets. Um, but I think there's a fairly significant size of engaged users who come from the sales force, yes. Um, and we do tend to see in the markets where the sales force are helping us to acquire and engage and retain our users, that we do see deeper engagement and we do see deeper penetration. Yes. I guess the question is around, it's, uh, is it an indication that they see it as a complement to what they're doing? Absolutely. Uh, again, I think that's... Um, that's when, when field force teams are talking about Univadis, it's not normally part of their day-to-day -day job. It's not something that they're incentivized to do. Um, but again, we do see in the markets where it does happen that it's, it starts maybe with a core kernel of people who are real champions for believing that this service is useful for helping them to partner with their, their clients. Um, and it will snowball from there. So yes, I do think that the feedback we get is always very positive. Hi, you mentioned that um, customers can come onto the site and they're registering obviously for a non-promotional site, but mm -hmm. while they're on it, one of the benefits is they can then register for promotional mailings. Mm -hmm. How many customers do actually enter the site on a non-promotional basis and request for promotional mailings from it? From a global perspective, about 70%. Some markets it's as high as 95%, some it's a bit lower, but overall, I think we forget as pharma that actually people want to know about what we have to say about our products. They need to know what we have to say about our products and it's not a bad thing to talk to them about it. The bad thing is to try and push the message in a way that they're not going to engage with or that they don't want. So if you can, again, go, going back to that point about if you put the control over that communication into their hands, not a problem. Hi, yes, as I understand it, it's only got, there's only access for health professionals. Is that right? Now, this is good information, and, and one of my views is that, you know, intelligent people or in, in the wider public should have access to good medical information that we need to break down these barriers that maybe doctors like, but actually where we inform patients. Why, why not give access to patients and people and the general public? I wouldn't say that it's something that's, that we don't want to do, right? It's for the moment we focused on developing that relationship with a healthcare professional and really to be able to provide an individual personalized service, um, we have to have people register to be able to do that. And people don't like to register, right? So you have to sort of maintain some balance between how much content you provide open access versus how much content you would provide on a per registration basis. Will we look at patients in the future? It's not on the roadmap at the moment, I would say. We've got enough on our plate with trying to relaunch the service in our 40 markets. Um, but I agree, this, the information on there is valuable, could be valuable for patient audiences, for payer audiences, and we've got to find ways to make that possible. But we haven't found it just yet. Okay. So, Shen, I've got one more question. So, you're probably quite happy that MSD's got the dominant position here. Um, but do you think there's space for other pharma companies to do something similar? I hope not. <laughs> um, well, I think there are things like this going on with other pharma companies. I wouldn't say there's anything on this scale um, from a global point of view, but we do see um, smaller, whether they be sort of niche around a particular disease area or a particular geography, the services are there. Um, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Shona, and thanks, Michelle. And it's now coffee break. Thanks, everyone. Bye.